Okay, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Faraj Kuliev and I'm working here at uh, Global Challenge. Uh, let me just start with a few words about Global Challenge. Uh, so we are an uh, independent think tank and a policy institute or, or policy institute and mainly working with the environmental policies, migration policies and economics as we do today. Uh, our guest today is Jeffrey Somers, and uh, we've also actually started since 2010. We have uh, done a quite large project on uh, euro crisis, unemployment, and uh, financial markets. Uh, we've uh, published uh, six books, uh, which actually you can take uh, right there. And uh, in those books, we have uh, problematized and analyzed the problems with austerity and. Uh, budget consolidations in times of crisis. Today's subject is uh, Baltic Tiger and, or Pepo Tiger about Latvia's uh, austerity experiment. And uh, uh, with us is Jeffrey Sommers, again, mm -hmm. uh, Associate Professor of Political Economy and Public Policy uh, at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, if yes. I so right. And uh, you're also uh, visiting faculty at uh, Stockholm University Stockholm School of University in Riga. Yes. And also been advisor for Latvian governments yes. to level of uh, prime minister. Uh, so Jeffrey Samos will have a short presentation and uh, after we will have a time for questions from the audience. And you're well welcome to stay after with us to discuss. It's a very good weather. So I leave the floor to you, Jeffrey. Welcome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Faraj. And thank you to the uh, Global Challenge for hosting me. It's my pleasure to uh, see you today and to present on events in the Baltic states, not only since the recent 2008 crisis, but perhaps in a, a longer time frame, looking at independence up through to the present and how the policies that have been deployed over the past two decades have led us to the present moment. Um, I would also uh, inform you that myself and Charles Wolfson, who is here, and my colleague, Audrinus Yuska, have a new volume that will be published in January of 2014 on the contradictions of austerity in which we look at the three Baltic states. Um, so I would um, um, be happy to provide you with information about that volume, including the Rutledge website, which has the information about it. So let's uh, start. Uh, as the title here suggests, we have two views, at least, of the Baltic states. One is that something of an economic miracle has been performed in terms of rescuing the crisis economies of the Baltic states. And then others uh, suggest that the situation perhaps is not as good as it would appear at first glance. So let's take a look first at what has gone right. If we take a look at Latvia's GDP from the point of the crisis in just before, these are quarterly numbers. We see, of course, the big crash that we observed in Latvia. Over this two-year time frame, we saw the economy contract by some 25%. So the largest economic contraction in all of the European Union. And then we see by the last quarter of 2010 uh, some recovery. And so the numbers get quite good in late 2011 and in early 2012. Uh, then begin to stabilize somewhat and are now kind of on somewhat of a downward trajectory. So uh, we do see uh, a period of recovery after a very deep uh, crisis, but we still are not yet at the point where the losses from the 2008 crisis have been recovered with the uh, uh, recovery period here. And uh, to be fair to the Baltic states, because oftentimes the criticism has been made that in all of these countries that they haven't really recaptured their pre-crisis levels of GDP. But one has to remember that their economies were artificially inflated by cheap credit, which led to foreign direct investment pouring into the residential uh, and commercial property markets, thus perhaps inflating their economies beyond the uh, size that they really should have been. So it was really speculative in origin rather than real productive um, capacity. Now, in terms of taming inflation, well, we can certainly see that inflation has been brought under control in Latvia. 
wages were growing very rapidly right prior to the crisis. And then, of course, we had the famed internal devaluation, which was deployed by the central bank to bring wages down. So what we saw with the Latvian central bank was an effort to bring wages to heel. And this was done with some rather large cuts to the public sector. So public sector wages were brought down by some 30 percent. Uh, there was a increase often in the demands that were placed on workers within the public workplace and so wages were controlled. Now these numbers are a bit fuzzy because so much of Latvian employment <coughs> is um, in really the gray, the gray and the black sector. So we have a lot of envelope payments and so once we get into the private sector it's very really difficult to, to measure just what people are in fact making. And also what um, um, the tax receipts should be consequently as well because we just don't know uh, what people are, are making as an average. So we do see that the economy is growing after the crisis. We do see inflation tamed. On the downside, we have the demographic issue. And we have people who are exiting the country in very large numbers. So we have, as uh, the Republican president in the recent U.S. election in 2012, referring to a period of self-deportation. People are leaving. Um, it's a very unpleasant situation for people, and so they're choosing to exit. And they're leaving in very large numbers, arguably in numbers which are just not sustainable. This is a chart from a demographer in Latvia, Mihals Hazans who gives his own numbers here with uh, these uh, lines above. And what you can see is that in the beginning of the 21st century, we see this uh, ongoing period of emigration. It's really never abated entirely from the point of independence in 1991. Comes down a little bit here at the beginning of the decade. I have this note here about EU accession. Uh, Latvia joined the EU in 2004. And it's often been claimed by many in Latvia's government that EU accession is what led to all of this out-migration. But what you can see here is that in the first full year after EU actually dropped, dropped yet again in 2006, dropped yet again in 2007, and it's with the crisis after that we see people leaving in such large numbers. So contrary that it's EU accession and having access to the Schengen zone, again, EU accession, uh, emigration slowed and then again it picks up with the 2000 and crisis 2008 crisis here now uh, in all three Baltic states we can take a look at population Latvia specifically we can see the large numbers of people who leave between two the red bar shows us net emigration but it also indicates a natural decrease one of the things that we're going to see here shortly is that Latvia not only has an emigration problem, it also has a reproduction problem. Uh, people are not having children in the same numbers that they did during the Soviet period. Uh, this is also leading to some significant decrease in population. We can see this chart here, which provides another look at Latvia's population, taking a look at percentage change, the rather marked a decrease that we see in its population from its peak point in 1987 to 1989 to 2011. One of the things that I would note here is that even this number is somewhat inflated. This number reflects the official census and there were political considerations apparently that came into play in terms of delivering that final number. I know two demographers who had connections to the census project and what they claim is that a methodology was chosen which would inflate the numbers to bring the population in above the psychologically important threshold of two million people. That more standard metrics for looking at population in Latvia would instead net a number of roughly 1.88 million in a best case scenario. Uh, to make a long story short, what they report is that they were using an electronic uh, 
database that was linked to a website that the Latvian government was using to keep records of people who were returning periodically to check on land, check on family, and anyone who was using this website was counted as residing in Latvia, when many of them, of course, were in the United Kingdom, or in Ireland, or in other countries. So even with this, we see somewhat of uh, an inflated uh, number for Latvia's population. Now here, uh, regarding live births, which I referenced before, we can see that the peak was reached in 1987 with some 42,000 children being born, and at the lowest point during the crisis, it actually dipped down to 18,000. So this is fairly dramatic. Now, again, we have to place this in some context. Uh, 1987 represented a time when we still had a significant number of people residing in Latvia who no longer do, who left immediately following independence, having some concerns over what might happen in the country, given the fact that they were ethnic Russians or from other parts of the Soviet Union. And so there was this wave of emigration initially after independence in which some significant number of people left. But this percentage of decrease in live births in no way reflects that percentage of people who left immediately following the 1991 independence. So you can see it's rather marked. Now I'd like to back up a little bit and provide a kind of longer view, a political economy, if you will, which will talk about the conditions which led to a kind of social Europe, a peace, a era of prosperity after World War II, and a period which increasingly looks at odds with the period that we inhabit today. Um, on one level, I would argue that a social Europe was made possible by the Cold War. And of course, it could live in the interstices between the US and the Soviet Union in which we had the demands of both the Cold War, the challenges of the Cold War, and the need to provide greater stability as a consequence of the, at some times, uh, what appeared to be threats on the eastern border and of course on the part of governments which were looking to maintain social stability at home given the fact that there were alternative models to potentially choose from. Uh, so I would argue that rather than seeing a greater period of freedom extending after the fall of the Soviet bloc beginning in 1989, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, we're seeing somewhat of a rollback of social democracy occurring across Europe. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. European unemployment, as we know, during the crisis has reached these almost apocalyptic levels in places like Spain, where you see 25% unemployment, much greater than you saw in the United States during the Great Depression. In old Europe, as uh, the United States' Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld used to like to refer to West Europe as, we see unemployment levels that are the largest that they've been since the Great Depression. And in new Europe, we see unemployment rates that are at multiples of the rates that were observed during the Great Depression. So employment is increasingly precarious and increasingly providing a challenge to the very viability of many of the states in the European Union. Of course, not all of them. Many, such as Austria and others, see relatively low unemployment rates, but we know that many countries are seeing these double-digit rates as well. Consequently, we are beginning to see more and more social unrest that's accompanying these economic challenges across the European Union. And the uh, very idea of a social Europe that Jacques Delors put forward is beginning to recede. You know, this idea that you could have social inclusion, sustainability of a capitalist economy, such as we saw after World War II, that you could rec uh, reconcile this with increasing economic liberalism is what we're seeing challenged at this time. Uh, the idea that Delors put forward that you could somehow bring these together is proving to be uh, unsustainable. What the future will uh, uh, tell, we'll, we'll see. But right now, it doesn't look good. And just to provide us of a brief reminder regarding the conditions that brought forward this idea of a social Europe that Jacques Delors advanced in the middle of the 1980s, we saw these liberalizing trends already at work in places such as the United Kingdom in the 1970s, 
1976, of course, we had the United Kingdom's Labour Prime Minister, James Callaghan, begin to liberalize the British economy. The political economy behind that is somewhat complex, but it ultimately boils down to James Callaghan having the Riot Act read to him by the then um, Secretary of Treasury of the United States, Bill Simon, who essentially said, we're not going to extend you a big IMF loan so that you can reorganize your economy, put all this money into state-owned uh, industries, and to pay for the rather substantial oil bill that the British had. Remembering that in the 1970s, the British North Sea oil had not come online yet, and during the decade of the 1970s, oil prices increased by a full tenfold, a thousand percent. So Britain found itself with an old, decaying industrial economy, one in much need of investment, and a huge oil bill. And so it had to run to the IMF for a loan. And the IMF was not uh, very agreeable in terms of extending capital for this purpose. Of course, we saw France with Francois Mitterrand go in an entirely different direction. He tried to double down on the kind of state-led policies that we saw throughout much of the post-World War II period. And this did not go very well. There was a capital strike. So the idea that you could just sustain at this point these older policies or even uh, uh, strengthen them proved to be a failure as well. I think I'm going to just skim over this slide. But what I want to just suggest in brief is that what we saw as an outcome of this tendency to liberalize was that ultimately most governments across the European Union went further in that direction. And then in the new millennium, in the new century, we saw an effort to accelerate the process of liberalization even further. And we saw this with the Lisbon Agenda, the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, and then this ultimately led to the 2008 crash. And with this, um, we began to see really uh, an, ab an abandonment in some countries of the Jacques Delors social Europe vision. The financial crash in austerity, just to look at some of its causes in Europe. Um, in brief, I suspect you know primarily what they are, a maturing capitalism, reduced investment opportunities, development asymmetries in the EU between the rich north, the poor south, and the poor east yet, insufficient mechanisms for recycling capital between the rich and the poor countries, uh, so we see, of course, structural funds from the European Union as one mechanism for doing this, but insufficient uh, to the task at hand, which is to recycle even more capital from the poor to the rich uh, countries. The introduction of a monetary union with the euro as a currency and the lack of monetary control that that gave countries as we went into the 2008 crisis. And then uh, a kind of opportunism. I mean, there were some who were looking for a crisis in order to further accelerate this liberalization tendency that we had seen in the European Union. And the crisis provided that opportunity to do so. Uh, Latvia. How does Latvia fit into this larger debate that was occurring within Europe and to a certain extent the United States? Uh, well, in effect, Latvia began to punch above its weight in these global debates regarding austerity, or at least these transatlantic uh, debates, because austerity policies had been introduced in places like the United Kingdom, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and with only mixed levels of success at best in places like Portugal and places like the United Kingdom with very, very poor results. Uh, the defenders of austerity policy, therefore, were on the, uh, the lookout for what could be a potential model to sell. And apparently, Latvia fit the bill. It was a small place. People don't know much about it. And so you could pretty much present it in just about any way that you wanted to, beyond the macroeconomic data, which everyone could take a look at, of course. So you could impose a success narrative on it. Of course, your uh, colleague, Anders Osland, was one of the first to um, suggest that Latvia should double down on austerity policies. In effect, Latvia had been pursuing a very extreme form of neoliberalism 
from the inception of its independence in 1991 all the way through up to the 2008 crisis. Government spending was getting a little bit high on the cusp of that crisis, but still, on the whole, uh, you know, its social uh, programs were relatively weak by European norms, uh, and it really didn't have anything like a development, industrial development policy or any kind of economic policy beyond just making sure that macroeconomic fundamentals were in order. So Anders Ostlund uh, came onto the scene and suggested that Latvia could impose austerity more severely, that it could get its macroeconomic fundamentals restored by pursuing a very strong, ardent form of austerity, and that uh, this would be an opportunity to bring Latvia to a speedy recovery. Now, one can argue that perhaps Austin was looking to uh, restore or rehabilitate his reputation. Um, most people remembered him from the 1990s when he advised another well-known politician who saw a record of mostly failure in his home country of Russia. So uh, this, in effect, uh, provided uh, an opportunity to, uh, um, uh, again, rehabilitate his uh, reputation. So in Latvia, we do see that a rather strong austerity program was introduced. Uh, I remember attending a lecture that Anders Oslin gave at the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, where I'm visiting faculty. And in May of 2010, I mean, he declared that more or less of the, uh, actually May of 2009, that the crisis was going to be over in just six months. And of course, it dragged on for another year and a half. Uh, but eventually, the economy did turn around, as you've seen the data on economic growth. And we've uh, seen some uh, pleasantly surprising uh, numbers on that score. Now, in that intervening period, since 2011 and 2012, when the economy began to recover, this is when Latvia was presented as this very impressive success story. And in May of 2012, the IMF and the Latvian government had a big conference in which they showcased Riga as this very successful uh, case of austerity. We had people like Christine Lagarde, who suggested that Latvia could serve as an inspiration for European leaders in grappling with the economic crisis. Uh, we had others, uh, such as uh, Oliver Blanchard and um, financial journalists, such as uh, Christia Freeland, who made similar remarks. Now, Latvia's relationship to the IMF was quite interesting. Uh, Latvia was unique, probably, among just about any country in attacking the IMF from the right. Uh, most countries attempt to defend themselves from the International Monetary Fund, suggesting that the austerity measures that they're requesting, uh, sometimes with some or no small measure of pressure, um, but in this case, we see a country saying to the IMF, you're not going nearly far enough in your advice to us for imposing these austerity measures. And we're very fortunate to have WikiLeaks because we have the State Department cables from the conversations that took place between the Swedes, the Americans, uh, by telephone from Stockholm, talking with uh, uh, Mr. Repsha, a figure who has been absolutely central at the commanding heights of the construction of Latvian economic policy from independence in 1991, having served in the finance ministry, having served at the central bank as its head, having served as prime minister, uh, somebody who has always been in a very prominent position. And in that telephone uh, call, they report that it did not go very well, that the IMF and the EU were expressing serious concerns about the income distribution profile of the country, which is a bit of a disaster, and that uh, perhaps this program of austerity could go uh, a little more kind and gentle, as uh, my former president, George Bush, used to like to say of conservatism. We can have a kinder, gentler form of uh, conservatism and of uh, austerity policies. Well, Repsha was having none of it. He said, we need to go harder and faster. We'll get this done, and the economy will recover. So we had people, again, in May of 2012 in Riga, who initially were concerned 
that the austerity program was being implemented far too fast and far too harshly, all of a sudden rediscovering their love for these policies. So we had people like uh, Oliver uh, Blanchard, who initially suggested that the internal devaluation program would fail, that they needed to devalue their currency, that they should go a little bit slower in terms of imposing austerity measures, uh, who now kind of fell in love with austerity policies all over again because of the, uh, ex the uh, experiment that the Latvians had undertaken. Very prominent financial journalists such as uh, Christia Freeland, who made comments such as the harsh Latvian plan worked because the whole country was committed to it. Now, my guess is that she never left her hotel, didn't bother to talk with a taxi driver, or never even ordered a drink from uh, the bar. Or if she did, she had somebody else do it. Because if she would have asked any of these people what the situation was like on the ground, she would have gotten a very different report. This sentence is almost pulled verbatim from the government. I mean, they have been very, very effective at repeating it early and often to any foreign visitors. So they come away with this impression that the entire population was behind this program of austerity and that they implemented it with the population's support. Well, uh, again, I would suggest that that hasn't been the case. Well, I'm gonna back up a little bit and give us a kind of long durée view of the crisis. I'm gonna suggest that Latvia's economic policy, of course, has changed a great deal over the past century. You know, we did have a period of independence between the two world wars, of course, so we had the period of Soviet occupation, and then, of course, we've had the uh, period since the Soviet occupation. And the economic models, of course, have been very different. The interwar period was marked by a national development model, a kind of a corporatist, uh, cohesive capitalist model in which the state actually had a fairly direct role in developing industry. Uh, and then, of course, we have this neoliberal model, which is imposed in the most recent period of independence. Now, Latvia's government uh, in the interwar period acted quite firmly and even aggressively in terms of restructuring its economy from the Russian czarist period and the time in which foreign landholders, primarily German, but also uh, many other European manor uh, holders as well, held the land in these large estates so one of the first things that the Latvian government did was it busted them up and it turned them over to a quarter of a million peasants, gave them each 13 hectares of land and set them up as no longer being paid or unpaid laborers for somebody else and actually making a living on their own farms. Uh, this issued forth howls of protest from other European governments who saw these uh, manors taken from their, their owners with some compensation. But uh, nonetheless, they did it, and arguably it was quite effective in terms of establishing a kind of almost farming middle class. Industry emerged in a fairly balanced interwar economy. Uh, there was everything from uh, Ford assembly of trucks and cars to light aircraft production. Here you see a Minox camera, which one would see in the old 1960s James Bond uh, movies where the spies would have these miniaturized cameras. So they had a very advanced optics uh, industry in the uh, Valsta Electronica Fabrica, the National Electronics uh, Factory that produced uh, very sophisticated equipment. And by the way, continued to do so during the Soviet occupation as well. And then of course, this raises the question of can development be achieved in democratic states? Well, of course we had uh, Kekkonen next door in Finland here, uh, where you know, the comment was often made that you know, the Soviet Union created a workers' paradise, a long pause, except not in the Soviet Union, but in Finland. Um, so we've seen these, these periods in which you know, the state has actually gotten involved in the idea of promoting social democracy, relatively equitable distributions of income, and economic development. Now, contrast that with Latvia on the cusp of its second independence. Uh, Latvian policymakers, the people who were very interested in what a Latvia would look like after this Soviet occupation, were really focusing their attention on this guy and what he was saying about economics. Because in the 1980s, the American economy, despite some deindustrialization, despite uh, widening inequalities 
uh, still you know, was a, a, a fairly prosperous place, one in which uh, working families increasingly needing to resort to a second uh, wage earner in order to maintain middle class status, but in so doing, at this very early stage of, again, these inequalities being introduced into the American economy at these higher levels, still looked like a very robust economy. Now, unfortunately for, I guess, uh, many Latvians, uh, you know, they weren't looking at this guy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who essentially uh, created the economy that they were looking at in the 1980s. In other words, this was before we had the banking deregulation of the 1990s. It was uh, when we had commercial uh, banks uh, separated uh, from other types of uh, banking. Uh, we had an economy which still had some significant labor union uh, representation. So it, it was a healthier economy than we see presently in the United States. Uh, but uh, the thought was that the ideas that were coming out of this administration were the ones to follow rather than what came out of this one. Latvia's economic policy, for the most part, was drafted in the seaside community of Unimala by a Georgetown American Latvian economist, a guy named Juris Viksnij. Uh, very much in the kind of University of Chicago School of Neoliberal Economics. And he led a, a group of uh, guys, they were all guys, uh, they were you know, called the Georgetown Gang. This was not you know, a name that was placed on them, they took on this name themselves. You know, a lot of economists, they like to think of themselves as rebels uh, and they, uh, they uh, you know, create uh, these uh, um, images for themselves that are much more interesting than their actual lives. So they, uh, <laughs> they, they create this thing called the Georgetown Gang. And they put together, over the course of some seven, or was it eight meetings in Yunmala, with people like the finance minister, who I referenced previously from that telephone call that WikiLeaks uh, has uh, reported, uh, with people like Repsha, with people like the head of the current central bank, uh, Mr. Rimshevitz, uh, with Mr. Guadmanis, who was the first prime minister of the country and then prime minister again during the 2008 uh, uh, crisis. Uh, and several other leading economic policy makers that continue acting in that capacity to this very day, they developed this report which essentially laid out a neoliberal vision for the country in which macroeconomic fundamentals would be strong and everything else would follow. So you didn't have to worry about trying to salvage any old industries. You didn't have to take any inventories of industrial equipment to see what might be reorganized into efficient enterprises. The market would solve all of those problems. All you had to do was to get your macroeconomic uh, policies in place and everything would follow. Perhaps the, well, to my mind, all of these policies were quite damaging. I mean, the extremely high tax on labor made labor much more expensive than it needed to be. The tax on labor had to be exceptionally high because there was no capital gains tax to speak of. Uh, the strong lot, the strong currency made it very expensive to uh, launch industries. So the, the policies which they undertook made it very, very difficult to support the real economy. It did, however, deliver on something that they promised. And that was foreign direct investment. Unfortunately, the foreign direct investment did not come into the real economy, it came into real estate. And it created this massive property bubble, which eventually crashed the entire economy. So it did bring in foreign direct investment. It just brought in the absolute worst type and into the wrong sector. Well, here's George uh, Vickstein here with Arthur Laffer. Uh, does, he, does everyone know who Arthur Laffer is? Yeah, yeah, Arthur Laffer is the guy who came up with this thing called the Laffer Curve in 1974. He was at a bar one night. He did it on this napkin. It's a very sophisticated uh, regression model that he developed. He, <laughs> he was at the bar drinking with Donald Rumsfeld in 1974, and he decided that if you, you cut taxes more, it would lead to more economic growth, and he had conclusive proof on this bar napkin. Donald Rumsfeld immediately called Dick Cheney and told him about it and was serving in the Gerald Ford uh, <laughs> administration, and eventually this got implemented as policy. Vic Sninchu I've had dinner with, he still loves the Laffer Curve and says that it proves that if you cut taxes it always results in uh, higher economic growth. So these were the guys who more or less created the rules for Latvia's economy and how it would be structured. Now I want to speak about another element of Latvia's economy and that 
is Latvia and you know, what I call and what uh, geographers like David Harvey refer to as the spatial fix to this kind of crisis of accumulation that we've had over the past 30 to 40 years. Now, uh, profit levels in the 1970s, of course, dropped generally, globally. And there was an effort to, of course, try and restore those and uh, uh, find a better way of organizing the economy and bringing it back to profitability. Latvia actually has an important place uh, in this story uh, because it's really in the 1980s and in the 1990s that the Soviet Union and the former Soviet Union is incorporated into the larger global economy, thus providing the spatial fix, including a larger zone of capital accumulation to help restore economic growth and profitability. Now in Latvia, uh, this took place with, fictor, with uh, uh, figures such as Grigory Luchansky, uh, who was a vice rector at the University of Latvia uh, he was fired for stealing university office furniture and selling it on the black market in 1984. And uh, eventually he becomes one of the world's richest oligarchs. So for some of you academics out there, there is hope for you. You too, <laughs> by exercising this kind of corruption, I suggest maybe you start stealing mobile phones from your university, can work your way up to the commanding heights of this uh, system of corruption and become a billionaire. He's now persona non grata in just about every country. Uh, he teamed up with Mark Rich. Uh, who was famously, or perhaps infamously, pardoned by Bill Clinton on his last day in office. And, you know, they discovered, of course, that through this process of global arbitrage, you could acquire Soviet state raw materials, oil and metals, at state prices, and then sell them for world market prices. And, you know, you could make a lot of money. So Latvia is the important uh, site where much of this material was exported from with its ice-free ports such as fence bills, but more importantly, it became the offshore financial center where the money was laundered uh, from the former Soviet Union and you know, what are now the CIS countries. So it's the usual story for that entire part of the world. You saw asset stripping. Stuff is sent out of uh, vents bills. And then again, the correspondent banking uh, sector, which is massive in Latvia. So, you know, this is what people who in the offshore industry euphemistically in very kind of 1984 Orwellian terms referred to as wealth management, tax optimization. Other people like myself call it stealing. Uh, this is where you, 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 you take money that you should be paying taxes on and, you know, you, you park it in Riga and then they send it maybe to New York. Here we have Lucy Edwards, who is a vice uh, president of the Bank of New York before a judge, a federal judge in New York. You know, there are certain rules that you don't break and she became too obvious in terms of what she was doing and eventually ended up uh, having to do some jail time. But if you, you know, mostly if you obey the, 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 the unspoken uh, rules, you're fine, you don't go to jail. Uh, but this activity became very important in Latvia's economy from the start. Now, while huge sums of money flow through Latvia, it doesn't really create a lot of employment. So that's one of the problems with it. Well, um, now I want to move up to the 2004 transition and inflating of the bubble which burst in 2008. So this is the year where you have both NATO and EU accession. Uh, you have all this global liquidity which is being created. Uh, my former president, uh, George Bush, was in part responsible for this, so we had a bit of an economic hiccup, a bump in our economy in the early part of the 2000s and decided that just flooding the economy with lots of cheap cash was the way to fix it. It worked for a while. Uh, and so then we also had the Japanese carrying trade. They were kind of pumping a lot of cheap money into the global economy. And, uh, you know, this, it's a kind of uh, credit Keynesianism. And Swedish bankers proved to be not too stupid, and they understood that, well, you know, you can borrow this money really cheap, and then you can lend it out to uh, these uh, Latvians and make a lot of money from them. Well, it all looked to work uh, quite well, uh, well for a while, but uh, eventually it got out of hand. I mean, uh, by the time we, we reach 2007, the uh, balance of payments, uh, imbalance in Latvia is just absolutely massive at 25%. Uh, this, so you have this kind of massive uh, import uh, economy all being fueled by inflation of the real estate sector, money that's being captured by Swedish banks, which they're capturing from the United States and Japan, which they're funnel funneling into Latvia, and then the whole bloody thing blows up on them like an exploding cigar. Uh, it, there were people like me who were writing articles as early as uh, my first one was published in February of 2005 where I was trying to warn the Latvians, 
don't do this, uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're facing uh, uh, economic disaster. Any sensible person would have saw this, but you know, they were making too much money, they didn't want to deal with it. So in effect, a Ponzi economy was being built with this asset inflation and the collateralizing of Latvia's uh, previously debt-free property. So a return of a debt serfdom, uh, so to speak. You had all of this marvelous property in Riga that was essentially debt-free. They inherited this from the Soviet period, debt-free. Uh, um, uh, you know, people didn't have mortgages. So you didn't have to use any of your income for debt service payments. So from the perspective of a banker, what an opportunity. <laughs> You've got all this property, which you can collateralize with debt and begin extracting rents from it. You know, this was a money machine that was waiting to be tapped, and they did. Now, at the peak of the real estate bubble in 2007, the real estate sector was consuming nearly 72% of all credit. This is non-productive. It's not going to you know, launch a factory or uh, some kind of business that's engaged in capital formation and the creation of real wealth. This is just for inflating the prices of, of property. It's not adding anything to the economy. It's a tax on the economy. So it's pulling rent, rents, I should say, out of the uh, economy. Uh, moreover, people would get trapped. Of course, the, the, the uh, banking laws are quite different in the United States than from the EU, and so here you have a tradition of being locked into loans. Uh, you can't walk away from them like you can in the United States. In the United States, if you get underwater with a mortgage, you can just uh, walk away from the property and say, you take it, I don't want it anymore. Of course, here, that's not possible. But what was really problematic for many of the Latvians was that the banks required that individuals get many of their relatives to co-sign onto these loans. And so, let's say you were a young professional, you wanted to set yourself up in an apartment in Riga, and everyone is telling you in the financial press, the government, everyone is saying you have to buy now, otherwise it will get too expensive. So you're rushing into the market, you want to buy, and so you get your uncle and your grandfather and uh, your mother, and they all have their little village houses and their little farms, and you get them all to co-sign. And they're all responsible now. They're all on the hook. They could lose their land too. So you have to keep making those debt service payments. And in effect, those are the people who really can't leave Latvia. Uh, they can't emigrate. I mean, they're the, the new debt serfs. Uh, they're stuck. Uh, again, largest decline in GDP of any country. Unemployment soars over 20%. One of the success stories though now is that unemployment has been brought down to 14.2%, but again, a lot of that is just because people are leaving the country. And an extreme inequality, if you take a look at Gini uh, coefficients for Latvia, they're roughly at barbaric US levels. <laughs> I mean, they're very, very high. But the, the real truth is that it's much worse. It's much worse than that. Because people don't report their incomes, their real incomes, uh, the, the data is, is a bit useless on this. So one of my colleagues, actually, at the Stockholm School, who was in Riga, who is now a member of parliament, parliament and is fairly neoliberal in some respects, uh, he actually used a different set of metrics for measuring inequality. He was using auto registrations. And he uh, came up with uh, Gini numbers that were at sub-Saharan African levels. Uh, so it's a society that's marked by extreme inequality. And of course, once the crisis hit and solutions for it were being examined, we quickly saw a shutting off of many alternatives. Uh, you know, we saw that Keynesianism could be maybe, you know, used for rich countries, but certainly not for poor countries like Latvia. And so uh, Joachim Almunia from the European Commission when he sent his letter in January of uh, 2009 to the Latvian government regarding the conditions for this big loan that they would eventually get for making sure that they could make their payments largely to foreign banks, but also to sustain uh, the government. You know, he very clearly said that to avoid a balance of payments crisis, that's what this money was for, restoring confidence in the banking sector and bolstering the foreign reserves of the Bank of Latvia. And then, he indicated explicitly what the funds were not to be used for. He said, worryingly, 
We have witnessed some recent evidence in Latvian public debate of calls for part of the financial assistance to be used inter alia for promoting export industries. God forbid. Uh, or to stimulate the economy through increased spending at large. It is important to actively stem these misperceptions. The money is not to be used for economic development. What is to be done? Well, they again decided to double down on austerity. Uh, again, the internal devaluation strategy was deployed. They drove working hours way up especially in the public sector, and of course, this um, also took place in the private sector, slashed social expenditures, which they claimed would just be comprised of needed uh, reorganizations of uh, redundancies in the social sector. Some truths to that, uh, but also went way beyond those levels that were needed to um, introduce new efficiencies. They began to export their way out of the crisis, and they began to do so through uh, increased clear-cutting of forests. Now, uh, on one level, they really didn't have a lot of alternatives to explore. So, um, you know, this is something that one can do for a while, but of course, at a certain point, it becomes unsustainable, and the Latvians have shown no sign of uh, pulling back from that strategy. They've also been selling residency permits <coughs> to uh, people in the CIS, which largely means oligarchs which gives them access to the uh, Schengen zone. They're quite cheap, actually. Uh, 140,000 uh, euros will get you access to the Schengen zone. And so these people then typically buy apartments, a residence in Riga. They dump some money into the local economy. So that's been bringing in some revenue. And then we've seen correspondent banking increase again, despite protestations from the government that it's not happening. And then we see this narrative <coughs> of this uh, uh, kind of Protestant morality play in which these plucky stoic vaults have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and have uh, restored economic growth and vitality. Uh, that the people were fully committed to it. Well, this narrative too is dubious and it, um, it's, it's really at odds with uh, the facts on the ground. Following the crisis, such as, sorry, this date didn't fully appear here, January 13th of 2009, there was a massive uh, uh, protest uh, regarding the crisis in Riga. 10,000 people were on the streets. I was there somewhere. Uh, so it happened. Uh, people were very concerned about the corruption of the past 20 years, uh, but also the kinds of policies that were being presented. I mean, it's hard to tell how many people were uh, opposing the policies that were going to be applied to solve the crisis and just the corruption of the past 20 years, but they were upset about a lot of stuff. Students and pensioners uh, protested uh, throughout the country. Farmers uh, protested as well. It, it um, really inaugurated a period of about a half a year of very intense protests, which then abated. And they abated as people finally recognized that the government was not going to change policy and that they could leave. So they exercised the exit option and they began leaving the country. So by the time the Christia Freelands and the Christina Lagards came to Latvia in May of 2012, there were no more protests. People had given up on that strategy. People who were upset with the way things were left. And we can see why they left. When you have poverty rates, which are almost half of the population, uh, how can you stay? Or extreme poverty rates, which are at a third of the population, this is just absolutely unacceptable. These are just some demographic numbers. I'm going to skip over those in the interest of time. In short, there was no consensus for austerity. And the reason that parties did not get elected out of office for suggesting the need for a policy change was because, at least in Latvia, national elections surrounded the ethnic division issue between ethnic Russians and ethnic Latvians. And so there really never was a clear policy choice uh, there was a new prominent ethnic Russian party called Harmony Center, Saskina Centers, which had emerged. Ethnic Latvians were quite concerned about it, and they voted for the party that seemed to have the best prospects for defeating it. And then uh, these issues of economic policy were secondary. So I'm going to conclude here by just saying that if you want to try this at home, 
Uh, you better have these conditions in place. You have to be a country that's small enough and willing enough to see 10% of your people leave, 14% of your working age population, uh, demographically secure enough uh, to see an exodus of this magnitude and then be able to somehow recover later. You have to have a population that is divided on ethnicity so that you can play them off each other so that you don't lose the next election when you try and implement this program. And lastly, it doesn't hurt to have a depoliticized uh, population that lived through the late Soviet period as well. I, I'm going to make this final note, and just to say again, regarding that correspondent banking issue, since the crisis in Cyprus last year, we've had the one in March, but also it, it uh, preceded that by the one in the summer of 2012, money has been flooding uh, from Cyprus into Latvia. So this is another a factor in the support of the economy. Okay, I'll conclude there. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you very much.